Hi guys, happy live. Hopefully you all had a beautiful Thanksgiving. I apologize, I'm a little bit late. I tend to be a little late. I apologize, sorry. Um, but thank you guys for tuning in. I will do my normal, so I'll answer your guys' questions that have come in throughout the week. Uh, some that I just picked. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask them in the chat right there, and I will get to them the best that I can. Otherwise, I will just ramble on. I'll also do some happy news and some real estate updates. Again, hopefully you guys are all well. Had a super long weekend and Thanksgiving, and um, yeah, I'm just going to ramble away. Hi, Scotty. Hi, Brad. How are you? Hi, Jackson. I'm just going to get into the first question, okay? And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. So the first question came from Craig in Elmville. So Craig in Elmville said, why do people take conditional sales on their properties? Doesn't that make less people look at it? Uh, thank you, Craig, for asking. A lot of people do feel that way. And to be honest, it's never you know specifically been tracked. So it's called an SPP or SBP. So SPP means sale of purchaser's property and SBP means sale of buyer's property. So some sellers think, hey, if my home shows conditionally sold, then nobody else will offer. But in the fine print, it does show an escape clause, which means that somebody else that does not have a home to sell or perhaps just has an easier home to sell or what have you could bump the other person essentially. And that first person would have 24 or 48 or 72 hours or something like that to firm up whatever is in the agreement of purchase and sale. So they can see that. So people will still show the property. Uh, and another time, not another time, another thing is often agents say it's like a back burner offer. So basically it's better than no offer at all. If the people sell their house, then great. And if they don't, then you can still offer it for sale to other people. Okay. So that's why it's kind of like a back burner, you know, better than nothing. And if they sell it, awesome. If not, you can still offer it for sale to other people. So depending on the seller, some people will go for it. Some people will not, but, um, it doesn't, you know, completely take people out from looking at your home because they can see that they can bump it. Okay. So thank you for asking. Hi, Margie. How are you? Um, thank you, Scotty. <laughs> okay. So first, again, we do some questions and some happy news before I get into the real estate news uh, and updates. And again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay. Okay. Um, Again, just randomness, happy news. I like random stories. So if you happen to give up a child for adoption, just make sure you give them a unique name. So a lady in Florida did give up her um, child for adoption 20 years ago. She named him Iverson. And her son, uh, who, so the little boy uh, she gave up was obviously a male. And then she had another son. And he knew that he had a brother somewhere. And he knew his name. He knew where he was adopted to, like what city and what have you. So one day he decided to go on Instagram, look him up, and because he had a unique name, he found him. He messaged him on Instagram, and 16 hours later, his older brother was flying to meet them, and it turns out he had three biological siblings. So I just like that. It was cute. Um, next question comes from Chris and Joan and Barry. So Chris and Joan and Barry, disregard the noise as my dog playing with his ball. Um, Chris and Joan and Barry said, we feel there's always something to be done on our home, whether it's eaves troughs or flooring or driveway, etc. We are thinking of a condo, but some fees seem astronomical. Why do they vary so much? Um, thank you, Chris and Joan, for asking. So I'm in a condo right now. So condo fees vary for multiple reasons. So you could live in the exact same condo. So I live in this condo and other people on my floor could have different condo fees. So it's based off your square footage. So let's just say the condo corporation says we need $3 million a year. That's, I don't know what it means, but let's just say to do the snow maintenance and to put money towards, you know, doing the roof down the way and put money towards doing the windows down the way and landscaping and repainting the yellow lines in the parking lot and paying the security guard and blah, blah, blah. Let's just say it's 3 million. It gets divided out what that equals per square foot. So if you have 980 square feet or 600 square feet or 1500 square feet, that's why it is more, you know, depending on the size of unit you have. And then let's just say you're in a thousand square foot unit and so is somebody else in a thousand square foot unit, but it's run by a different corporation, a different condo corporation. The one might have insurance for 3 million. The other one might only have insurance for 1 million. The one might have had a lawsuit. The other one might not have had a lawsuit. The one might pay 80,000 a year for landscaping. The other one might only pay 12,000 a year for landscaping, etc. So that's why it could be different. Okay. Um, but you can look into all that. Make sure your lawyer checks the status certificate so they can see, you know, are there any pending lawsuits? Do they have zero dollar in the reserve fund or do they have a million dollars in the reserve fund, etc.? So the lawyer can walk you through all of that to see what makes sense and what doesn't. If they're like, hey, this place is pretty old. They have no money for windows, no money for new boiler systems, no money for new roof, etc. You'll probably get hit with a special assessment, which means, hey, we didn't run the condo very well. We don't have enough money. By the way, you owe us extra money. That's what that is. Okay. 
Okay. Um, next was just a lady that came out of retirement. So she uh, is an architect in Pakistan, and she retired in 2005. And she did more like sleek buildings, kind of like Dubai type looking buildings. And then, um, again, that was 2005, she retired. And then there's been lots of floods lately there. So she ended up doing a million of these little kind of huts that were like fast to put together and so forth because she just felt a calling to that. So I liked three things of it. So um, the first was you're never too old because she was 81. The second was, you know, basically go after your dreams because she was the first woman in Pakistan to ever be an architect. And the third was to give back because even though she was retired and whatever, she felt a calling to give back to, you know, her city and her country, etc. So I like that. Um, next question. I have one more, I think, question before we get into real estate. So Matt from Aurora. So Matt from Aurora said, I sold my home eight years ago after a split up and have been renting ever since. Do you think it makes more sense to wait for the leveling out of the market um, than buying now? Um, thank you, Matt, for asking, assuming you're talking about next year, like a lot of economists are saying. And again, I apologize for the noise because my dog um, is chewing his ball right now. But so I think it was Matt, right? Yeah. So Matt, let's just say, for example, your mortgage would be $4,000, but you might get the home for, let's just say, 50000 or 80000 cheaper next year. But let's just say your rate um, because of the interest rate. So now you're not paying 4000 a month. Now you're paying 4800 a month or 5100 a month because the interest rate's gone up. So even though you get the home for cheaper, doesn't mean you're paying cheaper per month because of the interest rate. So how much more are you going to pay in rent in that amount of time? And then how much of your principal could you have paid down in that year or half a year or whatever it was? So I just like weigh all your pros and cons because a lot of people think, oh, I'll buy it when it's cheaper, but they don't think of the interest rates and so forth, okay? So um, I'm sure you're probably locked in on the interest rate for about 90 days, but I doubt you're locked in till mid next year or what have you. Um, so that's all I want to say about that. And then one more thing before I do real estate is, um, has anybody ever told you basically you had a dumb idea? There was a little boy in England and I'm going to, um, I was going to say I'm going to grab my dog's ball, but I'm not. Um, a little boy in England and since he was eight, uh, he was told by different coaches that he wasn't smart enough and he had a speech impediment and so forth and he wouldn't be good at soccer or football as they call it. He's from England. And his dad said, it's okay, we'll try again, we'll just try harder, we'll try again, we'll try harder, we'll try again, we'll try harder. And he kept doing that. He was like put on the bench for like four seasons. And then at one place, um, he was allowed to play 48 games and he got 41 goals out of the 48 games, which was obviously awesome. And now he's um, one of the top strikers, they call it. I don't really know football or soccer as we call it there, but he's one of the top strikers out there. And he has his own foundation, so it's called the Harry Kane Foundation, and it's for mental health, uh, health and coaching. So it's now taught in over 18,000 schools in the UK, and they have a helpline so people can call in and say, hey, this is happening or that's happening and so forth. So I just always like happy things and people giving back and, you know, thinking about their uh, mental state and so forth and, you know, just positive thinking. So jumping into real estate and besides my dog in the background... Um, so I'll speak a bit later about locally, and um, right now I'm not going to do local. I'm going to do all of Ontario, okay? So he's driving me crazy, but if I go to him, he probably won't drop it, so I'm going to leave it. Um, he's been sleeping all afternoon, but right now he's decided to play with his ball. So, sorry. Um, so what can you buy in Ontario for under 300000 Most people would say not a whole heck of a lot, which is true. So where would you think is the most you can get your, you know, most bang for your buck for under 300K and where's the least bang for your buck? You could probably guess least bang for your buck in Ontario is in Toronto for under 300K, obviously least bang for your buck and best bang for your buck is actually Windsor. So in Toronto, the, um, what you can get for about 300K, which I've never even heard of to be honest, is 247 square feet, which is smaller than my kitchen probably here. And in Windsor, you can get 980 square feet. So obviously that's a huge difference. So best bang for your buck under 300,000 is in Windsor. Least bang for your buck under 300,000 is in Toronto. Um, the top 10 places under $300,000. Barry actually came up on the list. It's not, you know, Windsor, but so Windsor is number one. London was number two. Auto was number three and Barry is actually number four. So they say that you can get 596 square feet under 300,000. Obviously, that would have to be a condo. Um, I don't really know of that many condos that small, but supposedly it came up on this list. 
Um, then it was followed with Cambridge, Hamilton, Oshawa, um, Ajax, Whitby, and St. Catharines. And then besides Toronto, the worst places for bang for your buck, you know, under 300,000 is Mississauga, Oakville, and Burlington are the top three. And then rounding up top five is Richmond Hill and Vaughan for under 300,000. Worst bang for your buck. Um, again, I'm going to tell locally later, so Simcoe County. Sometimes I do Canada, sometimes I do Ontario, sometimes I just do Simcoe, just to give you guys a roundabout of everything. Um, but basically, anyone hoping for a reduction in pricing, a lot of economists are saying that you shouldn't hold your breath too long for it. So they are saying that there will be a price decline in 2023, but it's going to be slight and short-lived. And um, most economists are expecting a 2 to 10% decrease in 2023, um, but quickly recovering because of demand and the amount of homes that um, are needed by people and immigration and so forth. So that is pushing the prices upwards again, they're expecting by the end of next year. Um, one economist said that the current lull is only temporary. There's obviously tons of things I could say to you, but I'm just saying like some of them are the saying, and obviously some are saying the exact same thing, just with different verbiage. So I'm just saying common ones. Um, and what else? Um, some people are saying, you know, let's wait, um, uh, to sell so we can get more money. The problem with that is, is majority of people are also buying, right? So yes, they're going to get more money if they wait to sell after the lull and so forth, but then they're going to buy and it's going to be higher as well. So, um, it's hard to say that. And then there is an economist, um, Rishi Sonti, he's from TD Bank. Um, and they're saying, or he's saying that they think another 0.75. So there's two more times this year that the interest rates could go up. And he's thinking it's going to go up 0.75, which would bring the current is 3.25 to obviously four. So that's what they're thinking by New Year's. It'll be about 4% is his estimation. Um, all the economists are kind of all over the place, to be honest, but that kind of seems to be the consensus. Um, again, I will give percentages later for locally, but something that is up across the board is renters. So in September, um, over 45% of transactions done in Ontario were from renters. Normally teeters around 32 to 35%. So almost, um, like I said, 10% ish more, um, were renters just because obviously the less people can afford to buy, the more they have to rent or leave province. So that was up in September. Apologize. It's getting darker earlier and I know it's super dark in here. Um, so on average, homes have gone about 3% per year since 1980 in Canada. But the first quarter of 2022 was obviously insane. So in Ontario as a whole, it went up 55.4%. So obviously 3% a year on average, but then 55.4% the first part of 2022 is insane. And if we just look at the GTA, it was up 41.2%. And if we look at the, it's called Exurb you know, like not suburb, but exurb, basically further one to two hours. So what they put in there, they said Barry, Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo, um, Hamilton, Aurelia, Niagara, that's what they call that, that extra bit of distance. That was up, and that's obviously where I live, was up 76.3%. And then Cottage Country, which is even further north, um, they counted as Bancroft, Muskoka, Halliburton, etc. was up 63.6%. So on average, normally only 3% a year, and then obviously a huge jump at the beginning of this year. So other Canadian places are also experiencing higher than the normal 3%. So BC went up, they went up 21.4%. Out East went up 34.7%. And um, Quebec also went up 32.6%. So Manitoba, it didn't go up as much, but it did also go up just over 12%, 12.3%. But somewhere went down in Canada, which was Saskatchewan and Alberta since the beginning of COVID. So um, Saskatchewan has gone down 3.4% and Alberta has gone down 5%. So this slowdown and like back to normal, when I say back to normal, it just means people now put condition on finance, put condition on um, inspection, put condition on sale of their purchaser's property, that kind of thing. That is expected to go out through most of 2023. Um, there was a recent study done by Oxford um, Economics, and it says that homes in Canada are on average 35% more expensive than the average family can afford. And um, the study basically looks over Canada and the states, and they said the least affordable cities, okay? So Vancouver was number one. Um, Boise, which is in Idaho, was number two. I just know that show on TV, Boise Boys, and I kind of thought it'd be a small town and be cheap, but supposedly it's not. Um, the third was back in Canada again for least um, affordable is Toronto. Then it jumped to the States again to Portland, Oregon. 
Then it was back in Ontario in Hamilton, which was surprising to me. Then it was in Vegas, so Hamilton is more expensive than Vegas. And then it was in the States again, San Jose, then Los Angeles, which is crazy that Hamilton's quite a bit more expensive than Las Vegas and um, uh, Las Vegas and Los Angeles. And then it goes back to Canada and Ottawa and then back to the States and Tampa. So we're expensive, we know. Um, the affordable cities, some of them were in Canada. So the number one was not in Canada, it was in Chicago. The um, uh, most affordable city in uh, Canada, not Ontario, but Canada was Quebec City. That was number two. Then number three was not us, was the States. Number four was Edmonton as the most affordable. Um, five wasn't us, six was us in Winnipeg. And then we jumped to number nine to get back into Canada, which was Calgary for um, most affordable. So homes in Toronto are up over 160% in the last 10 years in um, Toronto, which is obviously crazy. And um, now I'm going to tell you locally. Okay, so this is what happened in Simcoe County locally in September. Okay. So the average price is in September in Simcoe County. So Barrie, there were just over 735,000. Innisville were just over 805,000. Aurelia was just over 590. Oro was just over 910. Um, Severn was just over 913,000. Uh, Springwater was over 1.16. Um, Tay Township was over 706,000. Tiny Township was over 853,000. Wasega Beach was 759,000, uh, Collingwood was 739,000 and change, and Bradford was 1.139 and change. So there were 322 homes that sold in September. So that is 24.5% less homes than sold um, September 2021. Um, the year to date number of homes sold is 3,365 which is in Simcoe County, by the way, in 2022, which is 33.1% less homes than sold September 2021. Um, the average sales price for homes sold in Simcoe in September was 817,645, which is 2.4% less than last year, September. However, the year to date average in Simcoe is 953 and change, 759 to be exact, let's just say 953 which is up 17 point, uh, no, 8, 17 8 over the first nine months of 2021, okay? And the year-to-day average price in Barrie is now 854 and change, which is up over 16.9% from the first nine months of 2021. Um, and year-to-date in Simcoe County, the average is over a million, a million 55 to be exact, 525 if we really want exact, but let's just say a million 55, which is up over 17.2% from last year. Um, there were 818 new listings in September in Simcoe County, which was up over 44.3% over last September, which is pretty crazy. And um, by the end of September, there was 1,087 listings still for sale in the end of September, which is more than double September 2021. Um, basically, it was kind of the same in the rest of Canada. So there was over 44% new listings in the rest of Canada compared to last year. September this year compared to September last year. And that was for single family homes and then townhomes there were 13% more listed in September 2022 than 2021. Um, let's see, in September 2022, um, most people, um, or sorry, 2021, most people received 105% of asking. And September 2022, most people received 96.2% of asking. So not receiving over asking like they were last year or at the beginning of the spring. Um, year to date in Simcoe County for single family homes. So we're not counting townhomes or semi-detached homes or condos. Last year, um, again, year to date, so January 1st to the end of September, there were 537 homes listed, 3,822 sold. So 5,037 listed, 3,822 sold last year. This year, there were 5,850, so 800-ish more listed, but only 2,451 sold, whereas last year, 3,822 sold, okay? So 35.9% less homes sold in Simcoe County um, this year, year to date, now not counting the townhomes, et cetera. And last year, the average days on market was 11, and this year it is 16. And last year, the average sales price was 834480 This year, it is 964 455 to be exact. Basically, 834 last year, 964 this year. So it has gone up, and it is up 15.6%. Um, if you're wondering why I didn't include townhomes and condos, is because I'm going to do it right now. 
And basically last year, 1,500 uh, homes were listed, townhomes, condos, etc. in Simcoe County, 1,237 of them sold. And this year, 1,703 were listed, so just over 200 more were listed, but only 816 sold, so 34% less sold this year. And last year, on average, they were for sale for 14 days. This year, on average, they were for sale 17 days. And last year, the average sales price was $569 and change for these homes. This year, the average sales price was $679 for these homes, which is up 19.4%. Um, so in September, basically what you're paying for the following, it's getting so dark as I sit here. Um, detached are about $807 again and change. I'm not getting the change. Semi-detached are about $642 in Barrie. Uh, towns are $592 um, and um, condos are $539. I have a bunch of other areas if you guys want Innisfil or whatever, just um, message me or call the office or what have you. Um, detached and ESSA, for example, were 812. Semis were 635 and there were no condos or townhomes sold. I'm not going to do every single area because it'll take too long. It's getting too dark. Um, in Simcoe County in September of 2022 versus August of 2022, so not going back against uh, 2021, the average sales price was up 2.6% from August to September. Uh, it used to be 748 and now it's 768 and change, so that's good. Um, the average days on market has gotten longer though. It was 30 days before and now it is 33. Um, the next question comes from Courtney and Courtney is an Oro. Courtney said, how do you know when you should reduce your home or has the right buyer just not been through yet? Um, that's a great question. Thank you for asking, Courtney. So I would have your realtor look up comparable. So for example, if they send you actives and solds in your neighborhood and the solds are all 750 and you're listed at 900, the right buyer could have come through already, but your price is too high. But if you know your pricing seems to make sense, maybe the right buyer has not come through um, or maybe interest rates have gone up since that you know other sale told you you were worth a certain price, et cetera, and might need to be adjusted and so forth. But you really have to look at what's selling because it doesn't matter about if the right buyers come through or not. If the price is wrong, they're not going to most likely offer because they don't want to offend you. But thank you for asking. And just as an FYI, we do have a new program. So if you're worried the market's going to crash, we will sell your house for free. So if you buy a house off of us, and let's just say you buy it for 800000 then it's worth seven twenty-five, and we sell this for free. Just as an FYI. Okay. So next thing is um, a young man in Florida. So a young man in Florida was at the beginning of COVID and so forth. Um, he was um, 21 years old at that time. He's now 23. And basically, he was always tired. He lost a bunch of weight and so forth. And he thought it was just like COVID stress or what have you. Turns out he had some rare type of cancer. And they gave him eight months to live. Now he's 23 and cancer free and he has a podcast with his mom. Um, what is his name again? Michael and mom talk cancer is the name of their podcast. And he does like raps on TikTok all the time. Um, he said without like the community. So basically him reaching out and doing these TikToks and what have you, he doesn't know if he would be here, but just fighting through it. So I just like that again, positive things. Next question comes from Matt, and Matt is in Collingwood, and Matt asks, um, I have tenants that are on again, off again payers. They have said they will leave November 1st, which would break their lease. Should I let them or make them stay and continue as is with sometimes getting rent and sometimes not? Um, thank you, Matt, for asking. I personally would let them out of the lease because let's just say you don't let them out of the lease and they stay and then it gets worse and you take them to court. I haven't tried to take a tenant to court for quite some time, but I've heard that it's lengthy and almost two years. So what if they don't pay you a single dollar for two years and then they're stuck in there? I personally would let them out and take your losses. That's my call or my opinion, but you're allowed to do whatever you want, but that's what I would do. But thank you for asking. Um, okay, next is most men are obviously taught to not you know, talk about their feelings and not basically have any kind of emotion and so forth. So there was this company, and not company, it was in 2005, and it was in Australia, and it was called, I want to get the words right, I think it's called Man Shed or something like that. Um, what's it called? Yeah, Men Shed Association. And now there's over 1,200 of these sheds, and now they also allow women, um, and non-binary, etc. And basically it was a place where people were learning like woodworking, but they actually were talking as well. So kind of like little therapy sessions, and you're talking about your problems and so forth. 
So I just like that people aren't, you know, guys aren't being all like, oh, I don't need to talk about my problems and so forth, because obviously lots of people struggle with different things. So I like that. And um, the people raid range in age from 22 all the way to their late 90s. So I thought that was good to, you know, speak out, um, speak up and so forth and say, like, I'm not OK or I need to talk to somebody or what have you. And they're um, started again in Australia. They're throughout um, the States now and um, parts of Europe. So I like that. Um, next question comes from, let me go back to my page, I lost my thumb. Uh, next question comes from Tim and Brandy and Angus. So Tim and Brandy and Angus, what did they say? So Tim and Brandy said, um, where are they here? Um, we have no kids and I want to turn our one spare room to a closet and other into an ensuite. Do you think this would be impossible to sell when we eventually move in 15 or so years? Um, thank you, Tim and Brandy, for asking. Definitely harder, but it does, you know, happen. So, for example, I showed a home the other day and it has a gorgeous view. It was only one bedroom on the main floor and three bedrooms downstairs. So, I don't know, for example, if you were slab on grade, super hard to sell as one bedroom. But if you still have multiple bedrooms, you know, in like a loft space or in the basement or what have you, it's still doable. Just depends on people. You're definitely limiting your buyers because let's just say they have toddlers. They're obviously not going to have the toddlers in the basement and so forth. But if they have teenagers, they might like it or maybe no kids. Um, they're retired, etc. So it definitely will limit your buyers. But I mean, if you want to do it and you're going to live there for 15 years and you know that it'll limit buyers in the end. I mean, I've done things that I know will affect my price and not positively just because I knew I wanted it. So you're welcome to do it. But yeah, it's definitely harder. But I personally wouldn't do it if you do not have a basement with other bedrooms. Okay. Um, Okay, so a 10-year-old's dream came true. Basically, there was a girl and her family had fled Ukraine. Um, they ended up in different refugees and so forth. And then a man sponsored them from um, San Francisco or Bay Area. And they came over with their three daughters and they couldn't bring their cat. And they got them a kitten. But basically, the girls were all saying like, hey, we want our cat, we want our cat, uh, specifically the 10-year-old. So after a number of um, people basically got the cat over the border and onto planes and etc., 7,000 kilometers of traveling later, the cat was then back with her 10-year-old main owner and the rest of the family, which I just thought was cute because, I don't know, I like happy stories, so that's that. Um, so yeah, that's all basically. I hope you guys all have a super day. Go after whatever dreams you like. Sorry that I'm sitting in the dark. Be kind to one another and have a beautiful remainder to your week. Take care.